Today we're going to speak about Christianity. Um, Christianity is, um, it's hard to find one word to sum up Christianity or even a couple of sentences uh, because it's an extraordinarily diverse uh, religious tradition. Numerically, it's the largest religious tradition on the planet today, and some aspects of Christianity, such as global Pentecostalism, is the, uh, that's the fastest growing religious movement today on the planet. It went from about zero, from one adherent about 1900, from the person who initiated this new style of Christian practice and worship, to perhaps over 500,000 adherents in a century. It's an extraordinary growth. Um, so, uh, and Christianity being, it's numerically the largest, it's also perhaps, some suggest, it's the most diverse religion because of the many, many contexts to which it, as a missionary religion, has adapted itself. Christianity has an extraordinary capacity to adapt itself to virtually any cultural situation. Um, and as a consequence, Christianity comes in a bewildering variety of flavors, if you will. It's virtually impossible to try to get a handle on the, uh, uh, on the richness and diversity of this religion and to find uh, what all Christians would agree upon. In fact, that's impossible because it's so diverse re theologically over its last 2,000 years that some might even give up uh, might throw up their hands in despair and say, what have all Christians always agreed upon? Now, there are creeds, no doubt, and there is a mainstream Orthodox tradition that offers a clear-cut definitions of what Christianity is, but from the history of the tradition, we know that many of those clear-cut distinctives took some centuries to form, and that there has there have always been dissenting movements, some of great influence, that have differed from. Uh, many of these distinctives have rejected some of them, rejected many of them, have reformulated them, and thus gone about the business of creating ever new forms of Christianity. So then, if we were to try, if we were, if we did set ourselves the task of trying to find out what all these Christianities have in common, we might say that, well, pretty obviously, it's Jesus. It's hard to imagine a Christianity that's not in one way or another focused upon Jesus, no matter how he's conceived. What could link all Christians together is a focus upon Jesus and clearly not a focus upon the Buddha. So that is clearly, we have found at least one aspect. You might say the Bible, but the Bible has been evaluated in different ways in different Christian movements. Some Christian movements have, have uh, other sources of divine uh, revelation that stand alongside the, the Bible. These are very old forms of Christianity as well. The Bible, after all, did emerge out of the life of the early churches, so the older churches have a sense that revelation is a broader spectrum matter than simply the written text. And there are other forms of Christianity that have almost have authoritative texts, sometimes that equal the Bible. So. Um, so Jesus then would seem to be certainly not ecclesiastical structures. These are not common. Sacraments aren't common. Doctrines are quite diverse. What it is to be a Christian, how one becomes a Christian, this is quite diverse. Is it through baptism? Is it through a personal act of decision for Christ? How does one actually maintain the Christian life? Is it once saved, always saved? Should one participate in the, in the, the sacramental life of a church? Uh, should one engage in a self-purifying process? Uh, of asceticism and contemplative prayer, or is it sufficient to simply have faith that one is saved? These are diverse and profound and, and intractable questions. But Jesus does seem to be at the center of all of this. And in the Gospel of Mark, we find him asking his disciples, who do people say I am? And the questions even then in the Gospels were diverse. So who do people say that I am? Um, well, who is Jesus? <laughs> That's, that question may even be more difficult than what is Christianity. And if anyone is familiar with the scholarly literature of the last two centuries, um, uh, which are dedicated to, the, to searching for who Jesus really was, the Jesus of history, as distinct from the Jesus as understood or worshipped by Christ, different Christian communities, that very distinction, which is relatively new, about 200 years old, it gave rise in theological 
uh, centers in Germany and the United States and elsewhere and France to an intense two-century-long uh, attempt to try to discover who is the Jesus who was the person who walked around in that early period before he became the figure of the different uh, Christian movements. And we do know, of course, that Jesus was Jewish. He came from a Jewish background. He always was Jewish. He remained Jewish. In many ways, we can understand Jesus as a person who is engaged in a passionate quest to understand, to discuss, uh, like any other uh, learned Jewish person, the meaning of Torah. What does Torah mean for us? How should we apply Torah? And for me, that's the best way for, to understand Jesus. Now, for many Christians, that's not sufficient. Another way is to think of Jesus as God, as actually a, a member of the Trinity. Not all Christians have always accepted that approach. Um, others, um, more radically, think of Thomas Jefferson, think of the Enlightenment, stripped Jesus of all of his supernatural characteristics, stripped Jesus of his miracles, stripped the Bible of much of the, of all the supernatural features that make the biblical world more consistent with the worldview of people today living in many parts of the world who are attracted to Pentecostalism, a kind of a modern Western understanding of Jesus as a kind of a teacher of moral wisdom. So that Jesus has less and less relevance for many, many people today. It's the Jesus of miracles. It's the Jesus of the resurrection. This is the Jesus who appeals to the new converts in the two-thirds world. It's the Jesus who's a supernatural figure, a healer, a son of God, God himself in the flesh. This is the Jesus that seems to be quite relevant for people all across the planet. And even in this part of the world that was ravaged by secularism and by, by deism and by anti-supernaturalism, that Jesus, the miracle-working Jesus, the resurrecting Jesus, the Jesus who is God in the flesh, that seems to be the enduring Jesus. Well, what is Jesus' message? What does he actually mean for most people? Well, I would say that what vital forms of, of Christianity that spread like wildfire, and it often does, is uh, to relate to Jesus as the Savior, as one who saves you from sin, and more broadly understood, sin as, as death, and death as the, as the flaw in a cosmic order that was created good, but that through the entrance of this fatal flaw called sin uh, has become a place of, uh, of suffering and a, a place of dissatisfaction, but also a place, here a bit of my, the Buddhist theme coming in, but also a bit of a Zoroastrian theme, a place of moral realism, a place of testing, a place where we have to choose in each moment uh, between, the, uh, between the path of righteousness and the path of unrighteousness. And Jesus as Savior is one who opens the doorway to eternal life through remedying the sin that afflicts human beings uh, in the aftermath of the, the fall the fall of, uh, of, 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 of humanity through the primordial deeds of Adam and Eve. This is a story that's familiar to many Christians. Um, so I think Jesus as the Savior uh, is uh, what uh, many people would see as central uh, to Christianity. Uh, whether in the uh, in this in, in the places where Christianity is very mature, Europe and the and the Americas, the English-speaking world in general, and uh, and other parts of the world where Christianity has spread from Europe in the last few centuries, Christianity seems less vital these days. And in in Europe, it's kind of second great homeland, and it does seem to be disappearing from its first great homeland in the Middle East. Its third great homeland, uh, the 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 world of the of the imperialists, the wherever the colonializing Europeans went, it's strong in some areas. It's weak and others. But in parts of the world where the, where the colonial empires uh, did not manage to um, spread Christianity, today it's spreading very rapidly in many of those places, and I think it's the attraction to Jesus as the Savior. Some, um, uh, if one, were, if one uh, were to ask, well, where can I find out more about this religion without getting involved with any kind of religious movement, I would suggest that the best place to begin and is to open the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, to the Gospel of Matthew and to read Matthew chapters 5 through 7. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. And um, I have a wonderful quote that I'd like to end. The, the Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, 
is where uh, Jesus, uh, it's mostly sayings. And some would say that the most ancient form of Jesus' message was in a kind of a, a, a list of sayings, a, a saying source. And these are some extraordinary statements. These principles of ascetical and contemplative life are relevant even today, many of them. They, and many of them are, the most, are among the most famous utterances of Jesus. So Matthew 5 through 7. A well-known Thai Buddhist teacher by the name of Buddha Dasa, who actually uh, is responsible for sending many, many meditation teachers to different parts of the world in Thailand, uh, um, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, uh, held that even, quote, the few pages of the Sermon on the Mount are far more than enough and complete for practice to, to attain emancipation or nirvana. And... Uh, Buddha Dasa, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, did not hesitate to regard Jesus himself as a Buddha. So I would say that that's a good place to begin.